You're listening to Making Waves, Fresh Ideas in Freshwater Science. Making Waves is a bi-monthly podcast where we discuss new ideas in freshwater science and why they matter to you. Making Waves is brought to you with support by the Society for Freshwater Science, Arizona State University's School of Life Sciences, and the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. So this is Eric Moody with the Making Waves podcast with the Society for Freshwater Science. Joining me this month is Dr. Rafael Mazor, who's a senior scientist at the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project. And today he'll be talking to us about the subject of biomonitoring. So my first question for you is, what exactly is biomonitoring? Well, biomonitoring is a way of assessing environmental conditions or the the health of an ecosystem by looking at the types of organisms that live in that ecosystem that are exposed to the types of stressors that you find in that ecosystem. In streams, we're often looking at benthic macroinvertebrates, benthic algae, uh, macrophytes, to see which ones can survive the types of stressors that that stream is exposed to. Right, and a lot of this work seems to involve aquatic macroinvertebrates. So what is it about this group of organisms that make them particularly good at indicating the health of a stream? They're actually really useful for a lot of reasons. And it's not to say that other assemblages or types of organisms aren't also useful, but benthic macroinvertebrates are particularly easy for us to work with. First of all, nearly every stream has them in abundance, so you don't have a hard time finding enough of them to make an assessment. That's often a trouble with fish or other vertebrates. They have a very wide range of life histories, and that that means that they're they that you have some species that are sensitive to certain stressors, other species are sensitive to other stressors. So you really, when you look at the community as a whole, they can integrate all these different types of impacts. And it's for this reason that really most of the a lot a lot of the work in bioassessment really started with benthic macroinvertebrates, benthic algae too to to a large extent, but but invertebrates are. Uh, they've, I guess they've, they've sort of long captured the interest of, of stream ecologists for, for that reason. Another very useful thing about any of these types of organisms is that they're often directly related to some of the things that we're interested in measuring. And this is sort of a big contrast between biological monitoring and traditional chemical or physical monitoring. If you're looking at the impacts of, say, chloride pollution or copper or an oil spill on a stream, you can measure how much of that pollutant is in the water, and you can say whether it's above or below some regulatory threshold, but that doesn't actually tell you anything about the impact on the stream itself. Mm. If you're looking at the bugs, you can see, well, who could survive that impact? Who, who, who was killed off by it? And that gives you a much better sense of the, the condition of the stream. And that's often much more directly related to the, the mandates that we're often working under, for example, under the Clean Water Act or the European Water Framework Directive. They want us to look at the biological condition, the biological integrity, and you can't really do that except by looking at the biology. So is it easier or harder to use organisms as an indicator of stream health or would it be easier to just take samples of, you know, let's say the contaminant you're interested in? From my perspective, and this is definitely a personal bias, I think it's a lot easier. That's because I've had very little training in chemistry. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll confess that right away. But I think it's easier to understand the condition of a stream if you have biological data than if you have chemical data. Both help quite a bit. So, I mean, so there are some unique challenges that you have to deal with when you're working with biological data. It has a, I would say, a a radically different approach towards quality assurance from traditional chemical monitoring. With a chemical sample, if you process your your sample and you discover that your machinery was messed up, you have to flag your data. You might not be able to use it for whatever purposes you had, and there's nothing you can do about it. So quality assurance has this sort of really important role in terms of describing how good a job you did. With biological data, you actually you, you look at your, your organisms and you, you identify them. You can send them to a second lab for additional identifications. You have the opportunity to reassess your, your samples. It's not like you lose them by after mm-hmm. you've identified them. So 
to some extent, the quality assurance, while it's a little bit more complicated, it has this way of improving your data in a way that you can't really accomplish with chemical or physical monitoring. You know, you mentioned that there's different ways that we could monitor these streams. We could take chemical samples. We could look at the algae, the macrophytes, the invertebrates. But even, you know, just using invertebrates as an example, there's a number of different of these biotic indices that are used to assess stream health. So why are there so many different indices and are there benefits and advantages to using certain ones over others in certain situations? There are a lot of different indices, probably because there's a lot of practitioners out there that each have their own preferences. Mm. And if you're talking about different types, there are some that are multi-metric indices, for example, that are based on metrics that characterize various components of community structure, things like diversity indices or tolerance values, or can incorporate life history information. We have a lot of multivariate assessment indices that are based strictly on taxonomic identity. And there's, there's a number of other approaches. And I don't think the actual method makes a huge difference. I mean, there, there are certainly implications that go along with the choices you make. I think the more important challenge is making sure that those indices have correctly set benchmarks to identify when a stream is healthy and when it's in poor condition. I think that, that that's actually one of the biggest challenges of bioassessment is that it's hard to know what does a healthy stream look like. Now, we've been using the, the reference condition approach for several years now to base our expectations on the types of organisms we observe at reference sites. But we know that there's so much variability out there that it can be difficult to know what are the correct expectations for a given site. If you're at a certain elevation with a certain slope and overlying a certain geology, what are the types of bugs or types of diatoms you should expect at that stream when it's healthy, when it's in good condition? And then you can measure the, the deviation from that expectation using all sorts of different types of indices. Some may do better jobs than others, but I don't think there's necessarily one correct choice. So you mentioned the importance of having these reference sites. So when you're actually going out to try to assess whether a stream is impaired or not, what is the actual process of going and taking a sample and comparing it against a reference site? Well, I can describe the process that we've uh, recently developed for the state of California, which if you're familiar with California, it's a fairly large and fairly diverse state, and therefore it has many different types of streams, you know, from, from glacial fed streams in the Sierras to desert streams in the southern part of the state, most of it having a Mediterranean climate. What we do is when we, we collect our sample, we have a, a sampling method that is based on protocols that were developed by the EPA as part of their EMAP program, the Environmental Monitoring Assessment Program. It's a fairly systematic approach where you end up sampling all the different habitat types like riffles, pools, runs, basically in proportion to how they would occur within a given reach. So if you have data from a site, the first thing that we do in California is we try to characterize the watershed that contributes to that site. We, we use a GIS to delineate the, the catchment, and we, char we, we look at the environmental characteristics of that, of that watershed. We look at the geology, the typical rainfall and, and average temperature, we look at things like elevation, and we use that to sort of characterize the environmental setting that that site experiences. We then use these models to predict what types of organisms or what types of metric values we would observe at that site under similar environmental settings. And because all the, the predictor variables we use, things like area, these aren't really modified by human activity. Mm -hmm. So... This gives us an impression of what b the biological structure should look like in the absence of any kind of human activity. You then look at how your metrics measure up to these expectations, and you can interpret that deviation as some measurement of degradation. You, know, you go through these models and you say, okay, the stream is impaired. Can you actually say, you know, is it impaired for recreational use? Is it impaired for drinking water use? Is it impaired for wildlife? Or do you just say, we know that something is wrong and we should look at it? You can always say, based on biological data, that something's wrong and we should look at it more closely. Traditionally, this has motivated a number of findings of impairment on the EPA's 303D list. 
rarely, but perhaps increasingly, you will find listings that are based solely on biological impairment or biological impairment in combination with other types of evidence, such as elevated pollutant loads. There are a few water bodies that have been declared as impaired water bodies based solely on biological data, but this is currently the exception rather than the rule. Could you just uh, talk briefly about what listing a stream under 303D entails or what that means? Okay. So the Clean Water Act mandates that every state report to the EPA what are the health of the water bodies in that state, of all water body types. This is what we call the 305B list. That's named after the little section in the Clean Water Act. If a stream is determined to be in poor condition based on any of the the designated beneficial uses, uh, whether it can't support aquatic life, whether it can't swim in it or you can't drink it, it should in theory be added to what we call the 303D list, which is a list of impaired water bodies. When you make when you're on the list of three the 303D list, basically you're saying that there's a problem that should be fixed. Applying this framework to biological data is a little bit more complicated, but it has been done. Okay. You mentioned you know you work in California, which is a very large state and a very diverse state. So are there any challenges involved in applying these types of techniques across such a wide range of different types of streams, in particular? I know one of the things that you've worked on is trying to apply these metrics to streams that don't flow year-round. I would say what you've talked about is the principal challenge of bioassessment in a state like California, although it's probably also one of the biggest challenges in even smaller, less diverse states, because there's just so much diversity within stream types. You have large and small streams in all sorts of climates that support very different biological communities. There are some particular challenges that come with trying to assess intermittent streams. Mm -hmm. First and foremost is their regulatory ambiguity. Not all intermittent streams are covered by the Clean Water Act under federal law. Mm. However, California has a law that predates the Clean Water Act called the Porter Cologne Act. And there's really no ambiguity there about intermittent streams being considered, quote, waters of the state that the state is mandated to protect and manage. So in California, we don't have so much of the regulatory ambiguity problems that might affect other states. But there's still a ton of challenges, and many of them are logistical. If you go to a stream that has no water, you're not going to be able to sample it for benthic macroinvertebrates, and you're not going to know whether those benthic macroinvertebrates reflect a stream being in reference condition or not. That's just, you know, simple logic. Mm -hmm. If you're in a stream that has water, but maybe that water has only been there for a few days You might not have a lot of bugs, or those bugs might all be very early instars that you can't easily identify. If you're at a stream that has recently dried and re-wet, you might similarly have only desiccation-resistant organisms, but have killed off all the tolerant organisms through totally natural factors. Mm -hmm. You don't want to misinterpret those kinds of signals as impairment unless you need to. It's very expensive, and it diverts limited resources from where it would be better used. Mm -hmm. So that can be a big challenge. And there's also a particular concern that intermittent streams are such a large extent of our region in Southern California. And this is probably true in in even wetter parts of the country. Intermittent streams are fairly widespread. If we're not assessing them, then we're not really assessing our watersheds as a whole. Some of the things that we're doing to improve our ability to assess intermittent streams, we're exploring additional indicator types other than benthic macroinvertebrates that we think might be more effective in some of these systems. For example, we're looking at benthic algae. We expect in some of the very short-lived streams, the ones that flow for only a few weeks, you might not ever develop a fairly stable uh, invertebrate community. But we do think that the diatom or soft algae data could give you a good indication of stream condition. Uh, We're also interested in what I would call the extremely dry end of the spectrum, the arid episodic streams that flow maybe once a century or even less. These are still aquatic systems, even though you don't find water there. These are still vulnerable to development, and they're also parts of our watershed that we are interested in protecting. So how do you assess a system like that? We're looking at things more like uh, geomorphological features, vegetation, terrestrial arthropods, 
there's there's this is a, a subject with a lot of really interesting research. Every time I go to the freshwater science meetings, I always hear something about these uh, dry rivers or ephemeral washes, and I'm always fascinated to hear what people are doing in other parts of the world, particularly in uh, Europe and Australia. It's something that I think we're personally really actively looking to incorporate into our bioassessment toolkit here in California as well. Probably one of the most fundamental problems with assessing temporary streams is that we often don't know where they are. We often don't know whether or not they're temporary. Mm. We have a lot of maps that were developed in different eras with different climatic systems and what we're experiencing now. And so streams on in your USGS maps might be a dark blue line, but that doesn't mean it's perennial or it doesn't even, even mean that it's what has had flow in the past 10 years. So we need to update the accuracy of our maps in a way that reflects the variability that these streams exhibit in terms of the different types of hydrologic regimes. Streams don't neatly fall into two categories of perennial and non-perennial, and I think we need to have a, a, the toolkit that can sort of accommodate that kind of diversity. I would also argue, though, that intermittent streams are among the more threatened water body types that we have. One thing that I've observed in Southern California, and our, particularly in our urban areas, is that we import so much water and we use it for irrigation or consumption and we discharge it through our treatment plants or through runoff, that many of our intermittent streams have become perennial. We've perennialized a large extent of our intermittent streams. A lot of people assume that climate change might result in the increase in the prevalence of intermittent streams, but it really will depend on, on our management and how we respond to climate change, because if we continue to import and discharge more water, we're actually going to lose intermittent streams, at least within our urban areas. So I like to ask everyone this question. How exactly did you get interested personally in doing this type of research in biomonitoring? My introduction to biomonitoring is probably, it's a surprise to a lot of people. I got started in natural resources management in the parks department in New York City. It's not an area people normally associate with natural lands or wildlife, but that's actually where I first got exposed to it. I was trying to do bioassessment on some of the last remaining creeks in New York, hmm. and that's when I learned about all these methods of assessing environmental conditions. I was working a lot in Staten Island and the Bronx and Queens and looking for salamanders and mayflies and all sorts of critters. And it was a lot of fun. I loved it. It was, it was a really great job to do fresh out of school. My, one of my coworkers had gone to Berkeley in their, uh, in their landscape architecture department. And she actually suggested that I contact Vince Resch when I was considering grad school. And it worked out really well. I met with Vince and it was a, it was a, it's been a great relationship with him. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got started in bioassessment. Um, thanks again for the opportunity. Yeah, no, thank you. You've been listening to the Making Waves podcast, brought to you with support by the Society for Freshwater Science. For more information on this speaker, the Making Waves podcast, or the Society in general, please visit us on the web at the Society for Freshwater Science webpage. Tune in next time for another fresh idea in freshwater science.